following program is available in high definition on channel 700. This program is designed and produced by the community with the support of TV Kojiko. Hello, welcome to Oakville Matters. This is truly local television on Kojiko that gets to the heart of what matters to Oakville. And today, what matters to Oakville and what is going to occupy our conversation is Ontario's groundbreaking green belt and all the fine things that we'd like to see done to it. Mostly they revolve around expanding it. And we're optimistic about that. Let me introduce our, our panel, and, I'll, and then we'll get to, into why we're so uh, optimistic about it. We've got Shelley Petrie, who's the Grants Program Director for the Friends of the Greenbelt Foundation, Margaret Walton, a partner and a senior planner with Planscape, and Juliana Casimiri, who's the Executive Director of Oakville Green Conservation Association. Oakville Green Conservation Association is the original uh, environmental group of Oakville, the inspiration for uh, for many spin-offs. There's a Milton Green now, there's a Burlington Green now, there's an Ontario Green. It's a spreading concept and uh, Juliana, are you the third or fourth leader of the of the organization? So we were founded in uh, 1999 so we've got um, 15 years under our belt and um, I think I'd probably be the third or fourth um, kind of paid staff person that's in that executive director role. Yeah, so mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, I've often joked that the big test in life is uh, does do things continue after you're gone and the founders of Oakville Green are still alive and they're still watching Absolutely. but, but yeah. they've certainly gone hands off and uh, I, th I know they're very proud of, uh, of what's been uh, achieved and, mm -hmm. is, and, and everybody's thrilled with the way the, the movement is spreading. Um, now in the, uh, in the Crombie Report, uh, we have from the province an amazing document uh, and I call it an amazing document because the Crombie uh, panel was set up to review not just the Green Belt but other pieces of the province's planning regime. And they came out with uh, uh, a very thick report full of very, very good recommendations that I'm pretty sure everybody in Oakville Green and associated with the Green Belt is very excited by. And Margaret, I imagine, I, I believe even the agricultural sector is uh, hopeful about this report. Okay, I think they're hopeful, but I think too it needs to I think the good thing about the Crombie Commission is that they expanded it into the growth plan, which covers a much larger area. And one of the concerns about the Green Belt has always been it isn't really an agricultural tool. It in some ways created uh, barriers for farmers. So uh, hopefully uh, with the review, some of those barriers will fall. Well, I hope so too. In fact, we have a map that would be very helpful, I think, to people if we could put that up, Anthony. The, um, there's the Green Belt. And uh, in green, and as as you can see, the urban area in and what I'm going to call pink or orange or red, but anyway, obviously I'm not uh, I'm close to colorblind. But you'll notice an area that between the green belt and the urban area that is um, well, let's pretend that it's white, but it's 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 neither the urban area nor the green belt. And this is the area that uh, was the first object of our interest when we were looking at the uh, Crombie report. The idea is to, is to do something useful with that. The developers tend to look at that as a land bank and we who think the world should be greener and smarter and more efficient and cost less believe that that should be a food belt uh, rather than a future area for expansion. And then on the outside of the green belt we've seen leapfrog development and that's persuaded us that the green belt needs to be thicker and I was in Simcoe a couple of weeks ago talking to a surprisingly large group of people from apparently uh, all across the political spectrum. I was quite surprised at that, uh, talking about welcoming expansion of the Green Belt up into Simcoe. And um, uh, Julie, uh, 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 Shelley, I think uh, it would be good to know from your perspective 
how are we, how do you think we're going to go with the Crombie Report? Do you think it'll get adopted by the province? I know they've They've been a little coy about what they're going to do. Yeah, and we should hear uh, end of March, beginning of April, exactly what they're going to do. But we are optimistic that they're going to hopefully, anyways, um, adopt the majority of the Crombie recommendations. Uh, on the Greenbelt side of things, you know, we, we, we feel like that's only, that there's going to be enhancements, improvements to the Greenbelt plan um, that are some of the things that farmers are looking for, for a little more flexibility um, in being able to farm and to do value added and processing in place. Uh, and from an environmental perspective, um, one of the things that a lot of communities are really hopeful about is that um, what we've learned about the Green Belt, which is that boundary creates a lot of certainty for the future of agriculture and for the future of that natural heritage system in the Green Belt. Uh, because it doesn't allow development, and that's and it's a permanent feature, is that those lessons hopefully are going to bleed out um, both in growing the green belt in some areas where we're still seeing development pressures, but also just uh, increased protection of the natural heritage system and agricultural lands outside of the green belt. So the the agricultural community, they produced um, the Ontario Federation of Agriculture even produced a report called Farmland at Risk that they submitted to the Crombie panel uh, to say, you know, there's there's a lot of farmland outside of the Green Belt and uh, it's in danger of just being consumed by urban development and we need a better way forward where municipalities can think about, you know, what, what are the uh, uh, economic um, benefits of that farmland, uh, you know, where is the economic gain really concentrated on those lands and how can we better protect um, that uh, economy um, in the White Belt and then on, on the northern side of, of, of the Green Belt. And I think that's, that's a really robust conversation both within the Crombie Report and we're hoping to see from the province when the recommendations come out. I was really surprised to see uh, what I what looked to me like a change of attitude in the in the agricultural community uh, when it's when this started I mean ten years ago when I became mayor the conversation uh, around the agriculture sector and the green belt and urban growth tended to look like farmers hoped their last crop would be houses and 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 we had in Halton here we had a lot of that and it turned out that the farmers were actually farming on land that had already been sold to developers and the developers were in fact uh, long range hoping to turn the last crop of those farmlands into houses. But to be fair to the farmers, you have to recall that the cost of land in the Golden Horseshoe is just going through the roof. So for productive value, they can't afford to hold onto that land. They have to pay land taxes, which are based on the assessed value. So they do get a, a reduction, but even there, it puts them on a completely at a disadvantage to other farmers in the province. So the reason a lot of that land gets optioned off to developers is because the only way farmers can continue to farm it is to option it off, get money out of it, and then they go back and rent it back. So that's part of it, and I think... What if we in Halton were to change the tax rate for that class down to next to nothing with some kind of clawback if they cheated on us and sold it to developers. That's an absolutely, that's an excellent idea. I did a paper for the Ontario Ministry of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs with respect to the Crombie Report to say what tools could you use. So I did, I did a review across, across the world actually. I looked at Australia, I looked at uh, a lot in the United States and Europe. And in the United States they have exactly that. They create what they call farm agricultural enterprise zones. And once you're in that, you pay next to nothing with taxes. But if that land comes out of agriculture at a point in the future, they claw back. So it's a double. It's first of all, they create these zones where farmers have flexibility. And one of the problems with the Green Belt frankly was, and I've done work with agriculture for many years, is first of all, the farmers weren't consulted. Secondly, farming is not static. It's a very, it evolves constantly and it needs to be flexibility to respond. Most farmers farm both in and out of the Green Belt. The best land isn't in the Green Belt. It's the Peel Plain and the areas in Markham that are White Belt that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. So um, they felt like they got cut off because they've got part of it inside, part of it outside. And also they need services, they need um, a, a whole bundle of things to make them successful. Well, would you like to work with me to try to make that happen in Halton? Because, you know, that's a power that's totally within our grasp at the regional level. 
And if we did it, it would possibly become an example others could copy. Absolutely. I mean, I did work in Niagara where we pushed the envelope on the value added to allow additional uses. Now, you have to control it very carefully because rural land has always been the dumping ground for everything, no, you know, nowhere else. You're going to put the tire recycling, the sewage disposal, all that stuff just goes into the rural area. And we need to stop that, but we do need to give flexibility to allow uses that support agriculture. So yeah, there's lots of creative things we could do. I sometimes think Ontario has kind of forgotten its rural backyard, and it needs to turn around and look at it. And we need to produce, we need to retain the ability in the future for us to produce food. Well, this is an exciting moment for me because in all my uh, episodes of Oakville Matters, we've never had this kind of a transaction where an idea comes along and we say, yeah, let's work on that. So, uh, mm -hmm. so stay stay tuned. Uh, we we may uh, we may see something happening there. Um, on the uh, on the and in fact, building on that, the municipal leaders for the Greenbelt. I'm one of the chair co-chairs of that. One, that was that lay behind our submission to the Crombie folks that that we wanted a food belt instead of a white belt. Uh, you know that that note I said earlier about is it a land bank or is it a is a food and climate change with uh, California and drought oh, and, and the climate warming up maybe we're going to become the uh, farming capital of the world and uh, wouldn't it be a shame if we lost our uh, our best, our most formidable land. Well, I mean, Niagara, and I always say to people, if you've ever eaten a Niagara peach in July, why would you ever eat anything else? We, we grow great food. You have to be a little bit careful about calling it a food belt, though, because agriculture is bigger than just food. So you need to have a broad definition, and you need to give them the flexibility. It's a business, and they need to be able to be profitable. And the other thing that agriculture needs to have is certainty, that they're going to have access to land um, to, like, to grow pears. It takes seven years to bring an orchard into production. So somebody has to have a long frame, um, time frame, in order to be successful. And I say farmers plan in generations. They well, don't then plan we'll, in years. We'll also collaborate on a replacement for the term food belt. Yes, that would be good. <laughs> that would be good. Juliana, uh, in the in the Crombie report and in the in the submissions to the Crombie report, there's been a lot of talk about protecting the headwaters of the um, yes. of the waterways yeah. that, mm -hmm. that crisscross the GTA. What's your take on where we're going with that? Well, we'd love to see that happen, absolutely. So while we're at, well, you guys are collaborating to uh, lower the uh, agricultural tax rate, we'd love to see that source water protection uh, extended and also particularly from an urban environmental group point of view, having it extend down into our urban river valleys and have that be much more feasible for municipalities to do and uh, supported and, and easier for them. And we've looked at, um, Public land, our public land in the urban river valleys, but I, I don't see why it shouldn't be extended to the to the private lands as well because those those are our um, if we say that the green belt is like the uh, the belt that's holding up our environmental future and uh, then I think our urban river valleys are are the suspenders that are also you know keeping us lifted up so. And we need we a belt and suspenders that. approach to the environment. Exactly. <laughs> if we don't have those connections between you know north south between. Uh, between the source water and the uh, and the lake, then then um, we're looking at um, issues with water quality and uh, down, down so, the line. So, Shelley, what are you hearing about the the uh, headwaters and the urban river valleys? I'm hearing uh, um, signs, uh, rumors, uh, murmurings that they're going to do it. But I've been teased so long mm -hmm. for so, by by so many in the government that I I've grown really frustrated. Oakville and Halton unanimously requested the province to put into the green belt a piece of the urban river valley on the 14 mile creek two years ago, more than two years ago, yeah. and, and nothing. It's like dropping a stone down a well that has no, no, no splash. So uh, if I sound really frustrated about this, I really am. <laughs> well, hopefully that frustration will end uh, soon. We know that the Green Belt is one of the most popular uh, pieces of legislation that the government has ever put in place. We do po we've been done polling on the Green Belt for the last 10 years, every two years, and it uh, gets 90% approval ratings uh, by Ontario residents. Halton actually, the approval rating in Halton goes even beyond that. You, it, it's, it's, I think, the vast majority of, of residents in Halton um, uh, support the Green Belt. I think your approval rating was at 94%, so it was higher than any other region. 
The and Oakville was also um, the first municipality to actually grow the Greenbelt into the Glen Orkey lands. We're seeing Mississauga move forward on Greenbelting their urban river valley ahead of um, the provincial uh, uh, recommendations that we're hoping come out in April. But they haven't been approved either, though. But, but they've been approved by council. Um, right, they're in the same boat we're in. Yes, exactly, mm -hmm. they're in the same boat. And, and you've got other municipalities that are looking at it, too. We think this is going to happen. I mean, it's a it's 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 a great idea. You've got this rural landscape um, called the Green Belt, and it's uh, bringing the Green Belt into down through the urban river valleys is connect, is putting a direct connection with millions of urban residents who love the Green Belt. So having it in their backyards is really important, we think, for greater understanding and awareness of the Green Belt and for long-term future support and permanence of, of, of this landscape. And so, uh, you know, I we think the government is going to want to do that. Uh, but, and but we're hoping I have, to hear good things. I'd like to make one point, because you talk about the Green Belt and the approval rating and everything. You must remember that land is privately owned. And so it's all very well and good for the urban residents to look at the Green Belt as their backyard. It's not their backyard. It belongs to farmers, so to the we, majority of them. So when we poll, we poll both rural and urban, and the numbers are the same. There is still phenomenal support oh for no, the Green I, Belt. Oh, no, and I would agree that. But you have to respect the fact a lot of that is private property. And so when the Green Belt was first created, part of the animosity in the farming community was they were not consulted. It was imposed on their land. Sure, but in the urban river valleys. Yeah, so that's a little different. Yeah. And I agree that yeah. quality of life and yeah. all that that's in and also it's a good thing but yeah. just but I just wanted to correct they, that in the urban river valleys uh, we've for generations had had barriers to the use of that land yes. for development of any kind so it's it's not quite so black and white well and it's not black and white because Ontario has a planning process that says you don't have absolute right to do whatever you want with your land we, we, we have a public interest that overlies everything well, that's right you're a planner you I know am that. a planner I do know that but the only thing is we need to balance that so where you got a sector like agriculture where you're expecting them to continue to feed the populace and be successful, you have to also acknowledge what they need to do to be successful and oh, what tools I, I they need. Can't take the, I can't miss the chance to beat up on the OMB, the Ontario Municipal Board, just a touch. There's actually a decision last year by a member of the board that said you have uh, the, the province um, requires you to allow people to grow however much they want, wherever they want. And we're all just kind of, kind of going, no, it doesn't. <laughs> but oh, yeah. the board can no longer be really appealed, uh, except in very uh, tight circumstances. So we got this this crazy decision sitting out there. That itself is fueling, uh, and, you know, the horror and the and the uh, and the reaction to that decision is um, uh, among the reasons driving a, a very big push right now but, but to I'm reform interested. the OMB and to and to discipline the monster. Well, and I'm not as negative on the OMB as, uh, frankly, the OMB deals with the policies that are in place, and so sometimes they're a bit um, constrained by what they're given to deal with. So, uh, but when you, to go back, you can grow whatever you want when you want. Well, I think that farmers should be able to grow what they want. Oh, no, I meant grow however big a building you wanted, wherever oh, you wanted. Oh, no, no, no. Well, that's, that's what the no, board was no, saying. No, 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 I, I would agree with you there that that's problematic. No. We need to look at character and neighborhood and community yeah, and all board, those good things. The yeah. board forgot all that stuff. Uh -huh. <laughs> so so we were, we were some startled by that one, I'll tell you. Well, there are always startling events in life. <laughs> yes, yes. Apparently, my father, had a, had, my father has a saying, nothing's perfect. And uh, more and more, I see the, the, the truth of that. Yes. Uh, Juliana, what else in the Carnby Report gives us hope and uh, reason to be uh, uh, optimistic about the future? Oh, um, well, there's lots of lots of wonderful recommendations in there. Um, I think, from an, an urban environmental group point of view, the again, the Urban River Valley um, focus on that is really important. Also. Um, they did make some great recommendations for um, protecting natural heritage um, and biodiversity and, and enhancing. So at the moment we have, you know, the policies in place to kind of draw the line on the map and, and have some rules around what you can do in there, but we don't have the, the municipal um, and provincial support to do good um, stewardship planning in those areas, so we'd like to see those uh, integrated watershed management planning, um, biodiversity, like long-term biodiversity planning happen on those areas, and 
Um, if the uh, Emerald Dashboard teaches us anything, it's that we need to look at biodiversity seriously and, and pay attention to it. Otherwise, we'll have this line on the map, but it won't have any ecological integrity. Yeah, I know on, on the, well, on the EAB, and actually the, EA, the, the uh, that beetle's not the only threat to our tree cover. Mm -hmm. uh, we seem to be under siege by tree-eating devils. Yeah. Um, that's certainly absorbed a lot of money and time and effort in Oakville. Exactly. As we fight to save our yeah. urban canopy. Yeah. yeah. Um, on the integrated watershed uh, management, I guess we have to figure out how the cross lap, the, the overlapping and cross cutting jurisdictions of the region, the town, and the conservation authority mm -hmm. uh, can, can work together. Mm -hmm. uh, I just. Uh, was appointed to the board of the Conservation Authority, and I tell you that in the new direction that the board is taking, that the, that the authority is taking, uh, we're going to have to look really carefully at that. We hope uh, Oakville Green will, uh, uh, you know, contribute to that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. To the extent of your mm -hmm. interest, uh, Shelley, uh, from your vantage point, looking from a provincial level, and Margaret, actually, you know, as a professional planner and working in the province, you would have a a provincial level view. Uh, what's your view of the conservation authorities and how they fit into all this? I, I see them as under siege and under threat. Yes, and I think the the conservation authorities are, uh, act is going to be under review too, right? It is, and and yeah. I think that's that's needed. And that's um, where I think the threat is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, or hopefully good things can happen. Well, uh, the province has been cutting down its funding of everything, yeah. and that's hurt the conservation authorities. And then we have all this pushback uh, against the conservation authorities and and remember uh, they're not they're not messing with people in um, you know plain vanilla land they're mm -hmm. they're you're talking about floodplain and yeah. other areas where you're I mean, we're talking about no-go areas but th there are there's a couple of things though one is um, from a planning perspective I think we are getting more embedded in that idea that Planning from a, for a healthy watershed. Yes. Uh, and watersheds run yes. through all of our communities, right from the Moraine and the Green Belt, you know, down to Lake Ontario, and then up to Lake Simcoe. So planning from a watershed basis is really becoming more and more grounded in our policy, and we're hoping, and certainly the Crombie Report did this, is, is we're pushing that notion further, and that's where conservation authorities have a lot of role, a heavy role to play. And then the other issue is climate change. That is about to take over and be the number one issue among, you know, what the public is concerned about soon, to what the business world is concerned about, and certainly our governments now here in Canada, and it's, and it's, it's good to see. And I think that conservation authorities really have a role to play from a flood mitigation, because we are going to get more precipitation, it's going to come through more severe storms in this region, and that is just going to cost us millions of dollars until we can rein in the damage caused by those storms, and green infrastructure based on the, the enhancement of wetlands and other um, green spaces, which would, would be the expertise of the conservation authorities, or should be, is really where we need to go from a climate yeah. change perspective. I'm very worried that the province made promises it won't be able to keep. I want them to be kept. I think they were the necessary promises to be made. Don't make no mistake. But I'm worried that the, the underlying actions that the province has to do are not being faced by the province. I'm, and, and I can tell you that the mayors across the province, we're organized like we've never been before in the history of the province, and we're bringing that message to the premier at a summit on uh, March 7th, so that's coming right up. Yeah. But one, uh, of, the, but Margaret, one of the key go ahead. words you used was that you're organized. And so if you look at the provincial regime in managing the environment, so you have the Ministry of Natural Resources, you have the Ministry of Environment, you have the conservation authorities. It's um, when we, I did the Golden Horseshoe Food and Farming Action Plan, which was all of them, and we specifically in that exercise looked at the environmental regulations that farmers are subject to. And it is immense, and it's all in silos. And so I have a small example of a farmer who wanted to, he was farming a new field, needed an entrance permit, he had to deal with the Conservation Authority, the Niagara Scarpet Commission, the region of Halton, the town of Halton Hills. By the time he got the permits, the crop was gone. So 
it, and, and there's, there's no coordination, and there also needs to be more respect for, if you look at the rural land in the Golden Horseshoe, most of it's agriculture. So your farmers are your stewards, many places, of your rural land, and that contribution that they make needs to be respected. But there does need to be coordination at the provincial level so that it's efficient, and you don't have the Ministry of Natural Resources working against the Ministry of the Environment, and, and then the people in between are just caught going from one agency to another who may even have competing demands. I sometimes worry that the province sets it up that way in order to produce that result. But now, we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, I want to put in a word for regulation because uh, it's a great concern of mine. When you, when you become an elected official in a municipality, you're forced to take a water safety course now. And you, and you have to pass a test. <laughs> and, and it's all because of Walkerton where yeah. bad, um, you know, bad things were done and people died. And the, the pathogen that got into the water came from a farm that, that um, uh, you know, had cattle and the, the, the E. coli was, was leaching into the water system and the water system hadn't taken the measures that it needed to take to chlorinate the water. So there was a duality to the problem. There was the, the, you know, the source in the first place and the, and the complete and utter uh, abdication of responsibility to treat the water. So you had the, the, the perfect... Uh, uh, ugly combination, and um, and so some of the regulation that has been imposed through the years has been, I'll call it earned. Yes. Oh and, yes. Uh, and that's important to keep in mind. Well, I'm a planner, so I'm never going to argue against regulation, but it has to be practical and efficient, and allow uh, people who own land to operate efficiently. So, yeah. One of yes. my favorite planners once said, "I'm a regulator." <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm not that. I'm yes, a we're community builder yeah. now. But it does have yeah. to be a little bit rationalized, and so yeah. And Walkerton, now we have Nutrient Management Act, so, you know, it's been taken care of, which is a good thing. It's a very yeah. good thing. Although we now have to take a test, and, and we, I mean, they scared the heck out of us <laughs> because we can't be insured for this, and if we, and if we you know, ever get prosecuted, the, the fines are immense, the penalties, I mean, they really get your attention. Ah, so it's not that easy to be an elected official. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's... I mean, in many, many ways, it's not that it easy. It has its dangers now. <laughs> <laughs> it has its dangers. Too fast, then. Shelly, uh, how do we only have a second left? But tell people how they can get a hold of you. You you have an interesting sideline we haven't got into, which is you know you're the grants program director. Uh, maybe in in thirty words or less, you could explain how to how to follow up with you on that. Sure. So you can uh, go onto our website certainly and check out the work that the foundation has been doing, both in giving grants. Um, to agricultural issues, environmental issues, rural economy issues. Um, for example, we just built a big 500 kilometer cycling route through the green belt um, uh, as part of uh, enhancing rural tourism. It goes through Oak, it goes through Halton region. Uh, and so people can also just contact me directly. I'm, I'm, uh, my information's on the website. Uh, but there's an application process, and uh, we usually we like to talk to people first um, about their applications. Uh, but it's really about enhancing the green belt. It's the government does the, the land use planning policy, and we take the green belt and hope, hopefully, make it thrive and 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 work hard for everybody. Thank you very much for that, and thank you to each of you for joining us today. And I hope uh, uh, you appreciate uh, uh, that in addition to what you may have learned about the Green Belt and planning in general uh, for a better future in Ontario, you also got a chance to um, uh, follow up and get some money to do some good for all of that. So you actually get involved and get your, get your hands dirty, as it will. Uh, it's a great pleasure bringing you Oakville Matters on Kojiko which is truly local television, and I look forward to seeing you again.